that idea out and really expand upon it. Um, so I guess, you know, just start from the beginning and think of uh, the way you would analyze the debt of the government if you were analyzing a company and the debt structure of a company. And, and just think about government as a business. And, you know, it's really one of those things where uh, you want to focus on revenues and expenses because the government is borrowing money using debt. And roughly 95% of all U.S. government revenues come from taxes, individual and corporate income, payroll and excise taxes. 5% comes from estate taxes, customs, Fed earnings, penalties, and other fees. And just like a business, there has to be enough revenue to cover all expenses for it to keep operating. This is basically what you would call a budget. And in the business of running a country, taxes need to cover all of the government expenses, infrastructure, defense, entitlements, as well as interest payments on the debt. Well, that doesn't work, right? Well, they don't, at least. We spend far more than we make, as the U.S. is basically perpetually operating in a deficit. And it just gets worse each year. And if the government's operating in a deficit, it can either cut the expenses, generate more income by stimulating GDP, or raise taxes. The problem is cutting expenses costs votes. War can lead to future productivity damage. And higher taxes can impact companies' ability to grow and in turn hurt the country's GDP, leading to lower tax revenues. What's the easiest thing to do? Just issue more debt to cover the budget. Now this seems like a solution to the problem, but it's only a surface level solution, right? It's papering over um, bad allocation of capital. We know what happens to a company when it issues too much debt and winds up unable to pay the interest on it. It becomes distressed and it can't fix its budget problem and eventually goes bankrupt. The difference is countries are given a lot of leeway in the way that you know, they embrace debt um, and the amount of leverage they can embrace before investors start to you know, demand higher yields. We often look at debt to GDP as a measure of a country's financial health. You know, but you can also look at a country's budget, its actual revenues and expenses. Using uh, the tax revenues minus the entitlements minus defense spending divided by the interest expense, you can get what is called an interest coverage ratio. And this calculation is, you know, very simplified, but it, ba it, it gets a general idea across. The basic idea is that if the number is lower than parity, then a country must borrow even more money to buy or to issue more debt. This only leads to higher interest expense payments, which makes, makes the ratio even worse. It's basically like running up a credit card. The monthly payments are more than you have after mandatory costs like mortgage, car loans, and food. And so you open a new credit card to cover the gap, but your credit score is now worse and the interest rate on the new card is even higher Hence, the monthly payments are even higher, plus you've even borrowed more. Well, you could get another credit card to cover the raised expenses, but you're trapped in a debt spiral. It's really not that different for a country operating in a deficit, more debt, higher interest rates, higher deficits, more debt. As it worsens, investors generally lose confidence in a country's demand, excuse me, in countries demand higher rates for the country's bonds. And that really only makes the situation worse. It's when we get yields get out of control. We're actually kind of seeing that right now. And this just kind of adds fuel to the fire of the debt spiral. And now, if you look at the current situation in the U.S., you can see that the U.S. budget situation is not in great shape. The total U.S. federal debt is roughly $30 trillion. And U.S. GDP is roughly $25 trillion. If you include all federal, state, and local debt, the current debt-to-GDP ratio is 1.37, or 137%. That's extremely leveraged. <laughs> uh, that number may not mean anything, but uh, one way to put it in context is that um, 
the U.S. government has never been that leveraged, even at times in its uh, lifetime where it faced the brink of destruction, you know, like during the Civil War, World War II. Well, let's get back to the interest coverage ratio. Right now, there's, you know, $4.4 trillion in tax revenues, but the U.S. congressional budget counts $400 billion in other taxes, basically a total of Four point eight trillion in 2022, and even if we give them the benefit of the doubt, it doesn't look that great because entitlement spending plus interest on the debt is greater than revenue. If you take that same 4.8 number, you can see the mandatory expenses total 3.7 in that same report that generated the 4.8 number. That basically includes all entitlements signed into legislation that are considered absolute obligations, right? Cash flow obligations from the government in the future. And if you add on the 800 billion of defense spending, our expenses total roughly 4.5 trillion in 2022. So you have 4.5 trillion in spending, $4.8 $4.8 trillion in tax revenue, minus the $3.7 entitlements, minus the $800 billion defense, basically leaves you with $300 billion budgeted for interest expense. The problem is that the U.S. currently owes $400 billion on interest annually. You don't really have to be that smart to see how that's an issue. There's, the interest coverage ratio is below parity, meaning that there's not enough budgeted for interest expense. So with rising rates, as the current debt matures and needs to be replaced, the additional cost, up at, cost adds up rapidly. If we replace $30 trillion of debt at 3.2%, the annual interest expense becomes $1 trillion. So it, it's really not that You know, it's not like the peak interest rate necessarily is the most important factor, but how high do interest rates go and how long do they stay elevated? Because while they're staying elevated, debt is hitting maturity and being rolled over and being reissued. And the longer the debt maturities are being reissued at those higher interest rates, um, the more problematic it becomes for the future, right? You're you're setting up a scenario where you're guaranteeing more future, inflation in the future be as the you let interest rates remain elevated and i know that sounds contrary to what you know most people think because most people think that you know if you raise interest rates it'll actually um, fight inflation well you're just guaranteeing that you have more inflation in the future because you're letting all those maturities uh all that debt hit maturities and then be reissued at the higher rate of financing, which means that the government will have to spend more in the future uh, to, you know, to pay those interest expenses and to continue spending money. So basically, the government is bankrupt currently. Like if this was a company, uh, you would look at it and nobody would ever lend to it because they're bankrupt. They're insolvent. They can't pay their, their debts or their liabilities. Or put it Well, put another way, their assets are far lower than their liabilities, right? They're insolvent. Basically, if, you know, bonds were, the U.S. Treasury bonds were corporate bonds, they would be, you know, trade dramatically lower than where they trade today. You know, and it it really gets worse than that because uh, if you... Consider the reduced tax revenues due to lower capital gains as the market sells off in a recession. Then, you know, fewer individual and corporate taxes with earnings lower than the above estimates, you end up with uh, a problem where the Fed likely has to pivot by lowering rates and resuming quantitative easing. Another way to think about that is a significant percentage of the U.S. GDP is linked directly to the U.S. equities market. I, I, I've i seen figures roughly 60%. Now, some people may say that, you know, it's not 60%, it's 55% or whatever. But the point is that a huge, huge percentage of the U.S. equities market 
is directly uh, connected, or excuse me, a huge percentage of the uh, U.S. GDP is directly connected to the U.S. equities market. Um, so, you know, as uh, you know, as as the equities market falls, not only does GDP fall, but tax revenues fall from you know the decline in economic productivity, but also from the decline in the capital gains tax from equity sales. And then you get a situation where, uh, remember what we mentioned before, U.S. GD, debt to GDP gets even more leverage because GDP shrinks while the debt, more debt is being issued uh, to cover the interest expenses. So you see how it's like spiraling out of control. So if you just look at the math, it's, it's not a good picture. Um, you know, even the Congressional Budget Office agrees that, you know, if you look at their projections for the next decade, uh, they're pretty grim, to say the least. Um, just look at the projected deficits with their, you know, with their generous assumptions. Um, you know, they're very conservative in their grim outlook, right? They're, they definitely give the benefit of the doubt. Um, and even with that, it's still pretty bad. So really the fed the fed's real uh mandate despite their public facing mandate is to get debt to gdp down right so to the us debt to gdp is currently at 137% roughly and in order to do that they need to let real negative rates run negative for a long time right? what are real negative rate or excuse me real interest rates uh, real interest rates are when you take nominal rates which right, right now the current federal fund rate it's a little bit over 3%. We'll just use 3% for the sake of argument. 3% minus whatever the rate of inflation is. Again, it, that's hard to measure as well because you only have the government measure of inflation, which is far lower than the real rate of inflation. But the government rate of inflation right now is at 8 point you know, whatever percent. Um, it, real rate of inflation is probably, we'll say, 15% to be conservative. So you, you have negative uh, real rates in the double digit territory as far as if you take that those nominal rates minus the rate of inflation again it's it you know people would have arguments either way but it's very clear that uh, real interest rates are still significantly negative despite the uh, raise in nominal interest rates so you know the fed can let uh, real interest rates run you know and let inflation run higher than its two percent target um, in order, and that would raise GDP and monetize the debt, and they can use future, uh, cheaper future dollars to pay for past debts. And you basically stick it on the Fed balance sheet, and you know through quantitative easing. It's really only a short-term solution, though, because investors will eventually demand higher Treasury rates to compensate for being paid back in cheaper dollars, and an increased sovereign default risk. It's uh, essentially uh, a debt trap that leads to a debt spiral. And though it's likely to last a while, um, we're still in it. I would argue that we're in it currently and not only just starting to be in it, but we're significantly down the spiral past the event horizon, right? So there's no way to tighten back to reality, right? We've already passed the event horizon. The only way for the government to deleverage is to let inflation run. But again, like we mentioned before, it, you know, it's, it's a short-term solution and could have some pretty disastrous long-term consequences. You know, I guess the next question is, you know, how do you shield yourself from this? Well, you know, that's different for everybody, but, you know, it's really good to have some form of diversification, right? And, and in that, I mean, you know, across different asset classes, you know, whether that be gold or equities or Bitcoin, you know, that, that might be a little bit of unpopular advice because, uh, you know, people tend to pick one and then they, you know, that's their thing. Uh, but, you know, there's certainly arguments to be made um, for equities, for Bitcoin, for gold. Um, you can make a solid case for all of them. Now, you've heard me make the case for Bitcoin. Uh, I'm really not a huge proponent of gold. I don't, I think Bitcoin is demonetizing gold. Uh, but, you know, uh, there are some very significant players in the world who own a lot of gold. Um, you know, China and Russia, 
own a very, very, very significant amount of gold as well as pretty much every other central bank in the world. So, there, you know, there's always a possibility that if the world uh, moves away from U.S. Treasuries to a neutral reserve asset, that they could potentially move to gold, right? In that case, you know, you, you'd want to own gold. Um, again, that, there's no way to know if that possibility will come to pass, but, um, and I, su- I wouldn't suggest somebody own a significant amount of gold, but as a hedge, um, it's really hard to argue against that. Um, and then as far as equities go, you know, uh, I think what we're seeing with this debt spiral is we're seeing uh, the debt market uh, transition to the equities market. And by that, I mean, you know, right now in the, with the, at the height of the sovereign debt bubble, um, the, the, you know, the, the size of the debt markets dwarf the equities markets significantly by, you know, an exponential amount, right? I, I don't want to throw out a number out there. Uh, but would you just say uh, the, the global debt markets are orders of magnitude greater than the equities market? And, you know, people, people follow equities and they think that, you know, the tail wags a dog. But really, the debt markets are so much bigger than equities that what's happening in the debt market uh, is actually what's controlling what's going on in the equities market and every other asset in the world. Um, but that could change, right? Um, because debt is no longer... Right, nobody is holding sovereign debt to maturity. Um, they're trading it, um, trying to trade the central bank uh, positioning. Uh, but very few investors are buying sovereign debt and holding it to maturity. That's extremely unusual. And so basically, you know, that long-term capital is leaving the market, and all you have left are vultures picking at the bones of a once great market. Um, and my argument is that I think that, you know, that. Capital will flow out of the uh, the debt market, especially long term capital, and uh, naturally flow into the equity market. And I think I think you'll see that sort of the the disparity between the sides of the global debt markets and the equity markets kind of you know reach parity, so to speak. Um, and that that you know that that'll be interesting to see. I think when, if that does happen, then you see the you know at the backdrop of uh, you know central bank money printing. Uh, to keep the sovereign debt bubble afloat as capital leaves the market and to flow into the equity market, that's when you see like the mother of all bubbles, right? Like the just the the face ripping uh, equity bubble that is the last the last bubble. Um, I, I don't think we've seen the height of the current uh, global credit bubble that that. But you know, ag- again, some people might disagree with me. Um, you know. One thing is for sure, central banks will continue to manipulate the money and kick the can down the road until, you know, until they can't anymore. But there's just no way out for these sovereign nations, uh, whether it's, you know, a couple years or 10 years, uh, every single fiat based sovereign currency will eventually collapse under the weight of its debt because every central bank currency, at least the major central banks, are all past the event horizon in their debt spiral. Basically, what and you know, we don't know when this will happen. We don't have a crystal ball, but we know just by looking at the math that this is um, a guaranteed outcome, right? There's no, there's no way back, right? It's it's uh, it's just math. When this does play out, those who own, you know, hard money like Bitcoin, gold, even silver could be in that list. Uh, they'll have a protection against, you know, the hyperinflation and the global reset that we probably see. And, you know, again, it's it's very, uh, it's almost a doomsday scenario, um, and I don't want to get too carried away with it. And I also don't want to, you know, um, predict when it will happen. I, I don't know when it will happen. I, again, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict that, but all I can do, uh, you know, is uh, as a trader, is to position myself for what I believe to be an inevitable outcome, but also give myself an out if, uh, you know, that that situation that I perceive to be inevitable inevitable really isn't. Um, but again, uh, 
you know, I, I think the Mark Twain quote goes, it isn't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please just uh, subscribe.